So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lisa Davis, and thank you and welcome. very much for the honor to speak with you today. And um, Jessica asked me to share with you some thoughts about the Ford Foundation Metropolitan Opportunity Program and our approach and the things that we're learning and the things we're investing in. So um, let me start by talking a little bit about the foundation in general. As you all probably know very well, the foundation makes investments to alleviate poverty and advance social and racial justice worldwide. And we have three program areas, three broad program areas, um, democracy, rights, and justice, education, creativity, and free expression, and economic assets, uh, assets and economic fairness, which is where my program, uh, the Metropolitan Opportunity Program, sits. And while Metropolitan Opportunity Program is relatively new, um, Ford Foundation's assets program has a long history of investing in uh, neighborhoods and community development, and as you know, the, the type of work that, that you all do. Um, when the foundation undertook a strategic planning initiative about three years ago, as foundations are wont to do much to the chagrin of grantees and others periodically, um, the analysis that we had of the Ford Foundation's uh, legacy of investment in communities was that the neighborhood level work had done a lot of good to improve conditions in specific neighborhoods around the country. Um, it had created an industry and a professional class of people um, that were able to combine, uh, to be very effective in working on community goals in real politics, using sophisticated financial tools, and um, really be able to change the built environment at the neighborhood level. However, pockets of poverty have persisted, and um, they really have worsened in many places in the last 40 years. So the important neighborhood change that has occurred hasn't necessarily changed the fundamental conditions that create concentrated poverty and social isolation. And um, neighborhood change at the neighborhood level hasn't necessarily spread from one neighborhood to another in, in an organic way. Um, so we came to the conclusion that the forces of concentrated poverty and uh, the forces that create social isolation had to be addressed at the regional level. Um, we understood that um, Poverty is concentrated in particular neighborhoods because of what's happening at the regional and the metro um, level. And while we may be able to pr improve the conditions of life in particular neighborhoods and that that work is really vital and important, that um, we can't address the underpinnings of the problems that create concentrated poverty without looking at the whole region and without looking at development patterns um, in the whole region. So um, the San Francisco Federal Reserve recently published um, uh, a collection of essays called Investing in What Works, which I recommend highly. And um, many leading thinkers and practitioners in community development that you all are uh, probably very familiar with um, wrote in this, in this book. Um, and in, in, uh, Peter Edelman wrote in his essay um, that um, the stalwarts of the 1960s responses to poverty, uh, Robert Kennedy and George Romney, both recognized that the choice of where to live both in the sense of city neighborhoods being good places to live and suburban neighborhoods being welcoming is key to poverty alleviation. But strategies since then have mostly been neighborhood bound, that we need instead to truly connect neighborhoods to their surrounding regions, especially with respect to jobs. And Edelman goes on to say that our response to poverty must be integrated, uh, integrated housing, uh, education, early childhood, uh, and connection to jobs, and must also overcome institutional racism and behavioral patterns uh, endemic to concentrated poverty. So what does this mean about our definition of neighborhood preservation and community development going forward? Um, if our roots are in community development, uh, community driven responses to difficult conditions in distressed neighborhoods, how do we pivot to operate at the regional level and still be true to those roots and accountable to those communities? Um, as Marge Turner said also in this collection, uh, at its best, community development today isn't just about the built environment or about investments within borders of distressed neighborhoods, although both are very important. It's also about citywide and metro-wide policies that help poor people build skills, um, gain work experience, build savings and securities for their families, and it's about breaking down the barriers of prejudice that exclude low-income families from neighborhoods with great schools, safe streets, affordable grocery stores, and healthy places to play. 
It's about connecting poor neighborhoods to larger networks of services and opportunities so that poor families can move up and out of poverty if they want to. So it's this vision that underpins the investments of the Metropolitan Opportunity Program at the Ford Foundation. Um, we envision a future, uh, if, we, um, if this work is successful, where regions offer residents, all residents, the ability to live in quality community with good jobs, schools, homes, transportation, and other assets that contribute to quality of life. Um, we work with a variety of partners nationally and in select metropolitan regions to find ways to support systems that help people move from the margins to the mainstream of our economy. And today, um, the problems we're, you all are here to address don't just affect inner cities, as many of you working in rural and suburban neighborhoods know very well. Um, metropolitan areas form regional economies and share common resources, uh, common challenges, and ultimately, we think, common destinies. Um, so we work, across, we work with grantees across the country to develop policies that address key systemic issues at the regional level, while at the same time supporting projects at the local level to advance a regional vision. And our goals are to create sustainable and competitive metropolitan areas in which residents are empowered and engaged in advocating for equitable policies. We make investments to reduce spatial inequality and the racial inequalities that underpin them so that low-income people can build long-term assets and use them as a pathway out of poverty. We make investments in housing, transportation, and land use that advance these goals. So um, right now, all of our work uh, in this area is, is domestic, and we support efforts that reach beyond individual neighborhoods and cities to connect residents to opportunities in their broader metropolitan economies. Um, and we support organizations that pursue integrated approaches that integrate all three of these areas, housing, transportation, and land use. Um, so to have a greater impact, we work to break down the silos that are too often, um, that too often separate people from working together between um, transportation, housing, and economic development, as, as many of you all do in your own um, Our investments strive to promote smarter uh, public policy and planning, and links regional planning efforts to build economic growth and competitiveness over the long term with emerging national efforts to coordinate funding streams among cabinet agencies. And while progress on this front, I think, can seem frustratingly slow, I think we've seen more progress in the interagency work uh, at the federal, state, and local level than we have in, uh, in a very long time. Um, you know, perhaps this, prog this progress is driven by budgetary necessity um, and uh, a need to be more efficient with resources and to use resources more wisely through coordination. But I think it might also be that a new generation of leaders is unencumbered by developmentally, developmentally important but constraining structures and institutional boundaries of the past. So we believe this approach advances a new vision of smart regional development that integrates key elements of metropolitan life to build strong communities and sustainable communities. So what, what am I talking about? What, what exactly does this mean? Um, let me spend a few minutes describing our three initiatives in more detail, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some examples of things that we've invested in in the New York region, which is, which is one of our 10 regions in the country. So um, our three initiatives are expanding access to quality housing, um, uh, promoting metropolitan land use innovation, and connecting people to opportunity. <coughs> So uh, let me start with expanding access to quality housing. The goal of this uh, initiative is to increase access for low-income families to asset-building homes. And the challenge is that metropolitan areas are struggling with vast numbers of foreclosures, uh, abandoned housing units, um, and at the same time, these communities are facing affordable housing shortages, as you know well, um, uh, as families are displaced for, through foreclosure, uh, by foreclosure, um, declining incomes, and increasing joblessness. Um, the national policy response has been uh, frustratingly timid, and at the same time, um, conventional community development approaches have proven inadequate for addressing these challenges um, at the scale that they exist and um, with their ties to so much of what's going on in the mainstream um, finance world. Um, the economic downturn has revealed the need for more effective and stable housing uh, and community development finance. We saw in 2006 that the tax credit market essentially blew up and we were left without a funding source for and many of us for, for a year or two. Um, and um, so we need to think about how to rebuild that finance system in a way that's sustainable and durable and diverse uh, over the long term. So what we're doing is um, to help families in metropolitan regions move, move towards financial stability and security is to promote the development of homes that are linked to transportation and jobs and good schools and secure employment 
and to help provide innovative financing tools to purchase and maintain these homes. Um, in the short term, our strategy focuses on accelerating the reuse of foreclosed property and rebuilding the national housing and community development finance systems. For the longer term, we're advancing efforts to establish reliable and sustainable public and private finance flows to community development efforts and build a national infrastructure to promote innovative tools and practices to support um, the local efforts to do so. Um, we're also supporting uh, efforts to expand quality housing uh, uh, through um, alternative tenure and, and finance mechanisms to protect low and moderate income families from undue risk uh, that is, uh, and through systems that deliver financing permanently for affordable homes. So things like um, shared equity housing, uh, community land trusts, things that um, uh, have a, a, a organizations that have a, steward, a long term stewardship function for homes while well, also uh, uh, buffering against some of the market volatility. Um, the second uh, initiative is uh, promoting land use innovation, and the goal of this work is to stabilize neighborhoods through innovative land use and community planning strategies. Um, since 2000, the proportion of families burdened by unsustainable housing costs has risen 30%, and the number of low-income people living in concentrated poverty has jumped 40%. Um, employment rate is dramatically up. And meanwhile, poverty that used to afflict, uh, just afflict, afflict central cities has become suburbanized in most metropolitan regions. Um, coordinating national housing, transportation, environment, environmental protection, and community development policies with local metropolitan planning strategies, policies, and tools can spur su sustainable development in metropolitan regions and alleviate this concentrated poverty. So to revitalize struggling metropolitan areas and strengthen more stable regions across the United States, we support and advocate efforts that uh, for effective cross-silo um, policies. Um, and uh, this is at the national level. And at the same time, we invest in our 10 metropolitan regions um, to, uh, in these same sort of silo-busting um, activities. So in strong market areas, in, in um, metropolitan regions that are, prop that are higher cost, like New York, um, we focus on securing well-located properties for affordable housing development through inclusionary housing ordinances, through density bonuses for affordable housing and um, targeted land acquisition measures. Um, in distressed communities or weaker markets, we focus on eliminating blight through acquisition of abandoned properties for community-driven redevelopment and helping cities to make better decisions uh, about land use and, uh, and available land. So the third initiative is connecting people to opportunity, and the goal of this work is to connect low-income people to affordable housing, good jobs, and transportation through smart, and regional, through smart regional planning and development. Um, so, if uh, the challenge is that geographic isolation and the concentration of uh, low-income people in low-opportunity areas of the United States has worsened, um, we also know that jobs and services um, have um, moved to different places in metropolitan regions, too, and so that there's a spatial mismatch between where people live and the jobs and services that they need in many cases. Um, gaining access to these opportunities, especially for African Americans and Latinos, increasingly requires long commutes and high transportation costs. Meanwhile, state and federal budget priorities run counter to the needs of low-income workers, with three times as much funding going for highways and roads as public transportation. Um, smarter regional development strategies that expand and connect decent employment opportunities and affordable housing along regional uh, transportation corridors can reduce concentration of poverty and help regions grow in healthy and sustainable ways. So what we're doing at the national level is to support research and advocacy that makes the case for prioritizing public transit funding over financing for roads and bridges. Um, we also advocate for more public policy attention to the, full to the full cost of low and moderate income families. So that means not just housing costs, but also transportation costs and energy costs. And um, at local and regional levels, we support advocacy groups and coalitions to promote sustainable economic development practices and are able to connect work and um, work at the, and we're looking for connections between work at the neighborhood level um, that you all do and at the, at the regional and national levels. Um, we support groups that try and build this connective tissue and groups that uh, are seeking to ensure planning decisions and infrastructure investments are made in the public interest in their communities and that they benefit low income residents and communities of color. Um, so those are our three initiatives and we invest in them in, in 10 places, as I said, New York being one of them. Um, honestly, the New York metro region is, is, one, is probably our hardest region to, to make the case that there's a regional framework. 
right? It's, it's a fairly fragmented region. Um, uh, New York City, the five boroughs kind of operate independently on their own. Um, there are you know, strong suburban clusters in Westchester and Long Island and, and New Jersey. Um, but at the same time, the New York region re remains the second most racially segregated region in the country, um, I believe after Boston. Boston will be happy to know that they won something. <laughs> yeah, that's not what they had in mind. Um, so, you know, evidence shows that this segregation is deliberate, although often camouflaged, and not the result of race neutral forces or preferences um, of African Americans and Hispanics to live in segregated communities. So, um, as in all of our metros, we are supporting both the revitalization of distressed communities and um, in increasing access to opportunity um, in places, um, uh, uh, in high opportunity places for low income people and people of color. So on the community revitalization front in New York, um, we are working to support the implementation of the recently passed New York State Land Bank legislation. Are you guys familiar with this? Probably some of you in the, yeah, have you, you've worked on that? Um, Jerry Maldonado in my office is the program officer that primarily works in the New York region, so pardon me for some of my ignorance about this, the specifics of this, but um, uh, great to hear that some of you in the room have been working on that. Thank you. Um, We've been supporting the national intermediary that's working on it, uh, Center for Community Progress, Dan Kildee's old organization, or formerly Dan Kildee's organization. Um, and they've been providing technical assistance to the five recently created land bank authorities across the state to help build their capacity and to ensure that they sort of have the benefit of all the best practices that Center for Community Progress um, does. Uh, the New York legislation permits uh, up to 10 land bank, land bank authorities in the state. Uh, so there's a second round of applications currently underway, and the Center for Community Progress is um, leading the charge in working with communities that are in the process of putting these applications together. Um, in terms of expanding access to opportunity, much of our work in the region has been in support of regional mechanisms for inclusionary housing um, and for affirmatively furthering fair housing. So um, just as an example, we supported the creation of a Long Island affordable and Equitable Housing Working Group in partnership with the Long Island Community Foundation. Um, and then um, we've also partnered with Empire State Future and New York State Transportation Alliance uh, to create a statewide equitable TOD working group and to identify policies at the state level that facilitate more mixed income development in TOD sites on Long Island, Westchester, and the Hudson Valley. Um, we have had a past partnership with the One Region Funders Collaborative um, that supported the Regional Planning Association's application for a sustainable communities grant. Um, they were successful, congratulations. And um, the work plan for that, that grant includes the completion of a regional analysis of impediments to fair housing, which um, most ana many analysis to, uh, uh, of impediments to fair housing have either been done at the state level or at the local level. And we think that the uh, work to do them at the regional level is really important because, as we know, housing markets are regional, um, and if uh, you're trying to increase mobility, um, looking at analysis to impediment at the regional level is really important. So um, we're still in the midst of um, expanding our fair housing work to explore other regional strategies and other inclusion inclusionary housing strategies, so stay tuned for that. I uh, hope to have more information on that in the future. Um, I really appreciate your attention and hopefully interest in some of this. Um, I don't need to tell you all that times are difficult for affordable housing and community development, and um, this really makes the continued accomplishments of this group, I think, all the more remarkable. Um, with the difficult economic situation that so many neighborhoods are in, um, and federal, state, and local budget constraints, um, foundations, uh, uh, endowments are down, giving is down, um, and we know that many of the historic pathways to the middle class, such as the fixed rate 30-year mortgage, Medicare and Medicaid, low interest student loans, job quality and job stability are, are in jeopardy. And this might lead us to uh, feel overwhelmed by a mentality of scarcity and to draw ourselves, draw into ourselves and to seek to preserve the shrinking piece of the pie that we have. Or it might inspire us to new thinking and new partners and to new levels of ambition and flexibility, which is my hope. Um, if there was a time, if there ever was a time to take the wisdom of the people in this room 
and the power of affordable housing and neighborhood preservation organizations um, that you all have developed in the last 40 years to, to support a movement for broad-based social justice. I think the time is now. And um, unlike Paul Ryan, I know that I'm no Jack Kennedy. <laughs> but I think what JFK said still rings true. Um, never before has man had such capacity to control his own environment, to end thirst and hunger, to conquer poverty and disease, to banish illiteracy and massive human min uh, misery. We have the power to make this the best generation in the history of the world, or the power to make it the last. So after 40 years of affordable housing and neighborhood development, uh, practitioners have made incredible strides in so many of these areas. Uh, many neighborhoods have come back from places of desolation and abandonment, <coughs> thanks to organizations like yours and, and the work of uh, our foremothers. In places like the Bronx, while still dealing with issues of um, concentrated poverty, are flourishing with new housing and commercial activity and parks and open space and organized, uh, educated, and energized young people. Um, I saw it when I was a community, or community organizer in the Bronx 15 years ago. Uh, we see it in uh, some of our grantees like Sustainable South Bronx now. Um, it's really inspirational. And, um, you know, the ne neighborhood preservation work that you're doing is so important to securing the gains that you've made for the next generation to make sure that the children of the people who stayed the course in the neighborhoods, who fought to make them better places, can continue to live there and to reap the benefits. Um, I also think that affordable housing and community development uh, as an industry, as a movement, is really at a pivot point. The business model that we've used for the last 15 years is not working so well. Um, especially small and middle-sized organizations, moderately capitalized organizations, are finding it really difficult with current credit standards to do a tax credit deal every two or three years and kind of survive um, on the income in between. And um, it, it, it doesn't work anymore um, for many organizations. It, you know, the government contracts for many of the core services that you all provide are becoming much more difficult. Um, we're not making it any easier with things like strategic planning that shifts our direction. Um, we hope we've become more strategic. Um, but I think ultimately we need to find new sources of capital and new ways to use it. The good news is that I think there are new sources of capital and that you all are making great strides in innovation and innovative ways to use it. Um, we know from a survey of potential investors done by the Calvert Foundation just last year that there is a $650 billion demand for impact investments. $650 billion that's not currently being used. Um, and impact investors, investments are, you know, uh, any range of investments from sustainable investments to economically targeted investments that create social good. Um, I think community development and neighborhood preservation um, groups have become much more adept at using market uh, mechanisms to accomplish the goals. And that in the last three years, we really have seen unprecedented level of cross-sector collaboration, um, uh, sector integration to, uh, get to greater efficiencies and ability to, to create impact in our communities. So, um, you know, affordable housing and neighborhood preservation strategies have come of age. And with this maturity, I think, lies the promise of going to scale, of moving beyond what I think has been kind of a cottage industry at the neighborhood level um, to take advantage of, of, um, of, of bigger dreams, of bigger thoughts. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of challenges. There's uh, leadership development challenge challenges. I think there's a lot of organizations going through leadership succession challenges. Um, we all have to strive towards a greater level of operational excellence. Um, the operational issues are difficult and thorny and take a lot of time and attention. Um, access accessing new markets requires new relationships, new ways of thinking about um, finance and capital. And um, I think ultimately the industry and the movement will, needs to move towards some greater level of standardization um, and, and different ideas about partnerships in order to kind of get to the next level of scale. So, um, as we stand at the precipice of the 50th anniversary of um, the Civil Rights Act, the world has changed, and so we. So, as Jack Kennedy said, there are risks and costs to a program of action, but they are far less than the long-term risks and costs of comfortable inaction. Thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it.